Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Sam. I had the privilege of talking to him a little while yesterday, and uh, just after a couple of minutes of conversation, uh, God worked through him to encourage me and uh, just uh, confirm many things that uh, he's been speaking to me about. I want to say this. We, I'm, my spiritual gift is disorganization. And so, what you have in the, I'm going to preach the sermon that I have in the, that you have in the bulletin so you can take the notes. And that was, I'm sure that uh, Pastor Sam and I agreed on this months ago, probably. <clears throat> and I've probably communicated with a couple of other pastors in the meantime. So, I had in my mind that I was going to be preaching on uh, another topic this morning. So, what I'm going to do, but, and I advertised this topic in the meeting yesterday. And here's how I advertise it. So what I'm going to do just is to invite you to the uh, Cristo Rey service. I'll do that message in that service. Uh, and so will Regina because it's, you'll be translating into Spanish. But it's, it's, I think it will be very helpful to you. And I know it's a lot of church in one day if you do come. But uh, let's just, uh, I'm going to do this. Is the Christian life hard or easy, and I do this in all the churches in the United States I go, and so um, we always get the same vote. Um, and I want to take a vote this morning. So is the Christian life, how many think the Christian life is hard? So, okay, all right. How many of you would say the Christian life is easy? Okay, isn't that interesting? So you have a smattering of easy, but maybe a plurality at least of hard, and some of you don't think it's hard or easy because you didn't raise your hand. So you were a little cautious there. This is not a trap. <laughs> well, uh, so in the other service, um, I want to talk about that, and it's an exposition basically and summary of Romans. And I want to try to show that the Christian life is indeed easy, uh, not hard, based on partly what Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So how do we incorporate that promise into our lives. It's, and it's by grace, through faith, just like you received Christ. You live the Christian life in the same exact way. Paul said to the Galatians, Oh foolish Galatians, I only have one question for you. Did you receive the Spirit by all the things you said, keeping the law, His, God's Bible, your own, your church's, whatever, somebody's law, by being a good Christian, do you did you get the Spirit by that, or by believing what you heard? That's really important, believing what you heard. And, he, and obviously he says, the answer to that is we receive the Spirit by believing what we heard. You agree with that? You kind of have to, it's in the Bible. So, then he says, having begun in the Spirit, are you now going to be perfected in the flesh? So, it, but that doesn't mean that we have to keep believing the gospel. We do believe the gospel, but there must be something else to keep on believing if we're going to be perfected rather than just working hard and trying to be a good Christian. So that's what we'll talk about later. Today we're going to talk about the verse, and I want to start there. And you have an outline. I'll try to follow this. If uh, For some of you especially that are uh, what I, I do, personality profile seminars sometimes, and for what we call the high C, the correct person, the cautious person, the last person to finish the test, you have to get all the blanks filled in or it is very traumatic to you. <clears throat> and so if, you, if I miss a blank and you need to get it filled in, please see me later and I'll try to fill them in. There's one I'm not sure of here already, maybe in the, in the, in the uh, translation between what I sent and, and the outline and the, the thing. But uh, let's look at the verse again, 1 Peter 3. And in context, it's really talking about your testimony and suffering and persecution. I do believe that there is a, when you put this together with the pattern of Scripture, there's a, there's a great message for us. So it says, uh, verse 15, but in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. So that's the spiritual step for this. Otherwise, knowledge just puffs up, makes us proud. And Sam says, it's not about us, it's about Jesus. Um, and then he says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope 
that is in you. So I think this is a command, uh, that uh, a strong instruction that God has given us here. And you'll see why I think he chose especially the Apostle Peter, uh, when we use the verse in 2 Peter, to issue this command to us. Um, but the proceed, I'll read from the notes. The preceding verse represents a forgotten command. I think the church historically, I was just having a conversation with John here about this. I think historically the church has had times where they've forgotten this command. To be ready, that implies some preparation, doesn't it? You're going to be ready for something. You have to, you have to prepare for that. And so uh, I think that implies that here, that we need, should be prepared to give a reasonable answer. So I'm not sure what the blank after command is for in your notes. So, um, but in any regard, I think this verse represents a, a command that has been forgotten somewhat by the church. As a result of that, um, and I'll go back over this, and this is true in the United States, but from what I hear, it's becoming more and more true in Chile, and I'm sure other countries in the area. In the United States, 80% 80% of teenagers, 18 years old, who say they believe in Jesus and then go to a secular college, okay, uh, that'll, we'll get to that in a little while, uh, and then go to a secular college will either, you can't, I don't, I don't think you can stop being born again, you can't lose your salvation, I don't believe, but Many teenagers grow up in church and they, their faith is really in their parents or their leader and they say they believe in Jesus but they believe in him because of what their parents said uh, or what the preacher said and so when they go to college and they start respecting a professor more than they respect their parents, they switch sides. And they would, wouldn't they? Whoever they, is the biggest influence on them, that's what they believe for the moment. And 80% of teenagers who profess to believe in Jesus at 18, if they go to a secular university, will lose their faith. 80% statistically and say they no longer believe. Some of them actually, I think, are true believers and they eventually, God continues to work in their lives and maybe later they will come back and be involved in church. Some know. Um, but I think that's partly the result of the dilemma that the church has given them and not obeying this command of having reasonable answers for the hope that is in us. Uh, we are commanded to love God with all of our heart, our soul. What's next? Our minds. Our minds. Um, just to give you, we won't spend a long time with this, but to give you uh, some historical context for this, and I think to just, if you want to see what the enemy has done over history to, to put us in this situation, uh, in the 18th century in particular, a little bit in the 17th, but mostly in the 18th century, there was a cultural movement in, in Europe, in the western part of uh, the world, Europe, the United States even, England of course, called the Age of Reason, or the Age of Enlightenment. And you see that on your first uh, blank there. Well, there, this was a paradigm shift in thinking, in teaching, uh, about many things, but in particular about how we come to know things. I was talking to my brother yesterday about how we come to know things. Uh, there's the whole philosophy of knowledge called epistemology. But... It's, the age of reason taught that the only way to know that something is true is through evidence, physical evidence, and reason, the process of, of using reason and logic. And so your experience of life, of what it feels like to be a human being, is completely left out. You can't know anything just because you experience it. And so the, that paves the, the road for this idea that uh, nothing exists except the natural world. Because that's all we can see, feel, taste, or touch. So if we can't see it, feel it, taste it, touch it, and of course there's all kinds of self-contradiction here, 
in this view, but that's what the world has come to believe, that there is no evidence. The famous atheist Bertrand Russell, who wrote a book called Why I Am Not a Christian. Has anyone by any chance ever read that book here? Um, and I'm not surprised that you have not many people would have today, but in the 1940s, uh, maybe a little earlier, uh, it was the book about the excuse, if you will, as to why people did not believe. And if you read it today, it just like this guy didn't do his homework at all. Um, it's ridiculous. But in the day, that was the, uh, the atheist manifesto, you might say. And Bertrand Russell would go speak all around the country and, and uh, try to talk people out of believing and talk them into atheism. That's happening much on a much bigger scale today. Um, but once Bertrand Russell, Bertrand, uh, Bertrand Russell was asked, what if you're wrong and what if you die and stand before God and God says, why didn't you believe? Russell said in his British haughty type accent, he said, I would say, not enough evidence. <clears throat> God, not enough evidence. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> not enough evidence for what? Does he mean that the only way we can believe in God is to put all the mathematical numbers on one side and make sure the equation equals out on the other side and have some sort of foolproof and God should provide us so much evidence that we have to know that he is real? Uh, here's my point. And here's the answer to this verse where it says, always be, get, be ready to give a reasonable answer. And that's the word apologia in the Greek. A reasonable, you have two words, always be ready to give an answer for the reason. And if you put that together, reasonable answer is the word apologia in the Greek from which we get the word apologetic. So you'll see in your bulletin, I'm an apologist. So if you're not sure what that word means. So it is the idea that there is plenty of evidence and reason for the Christian faith in addition to our experience of our conscience and the conviction of the Holy Spirit and the message of the gospel that provides forgiveness for our sin. There is a host of good reasons, there, there, there are a host of good reasons and strong, logical reasons also for us to believe. We don't have to leave our brain at the door to have faith in God. But because it is a moral decision, because, uh, the, and we'll see this in a bit, Romans 1, we might not see it in a bit, I don't think it's in your notes here, but I want you to make a note on your paper at least, and I'll talk to you a bit about the verse. Rome, you, you looked at it yesterday. Romans 1, what does the Bible say about this? Romans 1, 18 through 21, and I, I hope you'll read that later. We won't read it all today, but basically here's what it says, that God has revealed himself, Bertrand Russell, not enough evidence, God, not what the Bible says, Romans 1.18, it says that, that uh, God has made it known, that really everybody knows there's a God because God has made it known to them, and the invisible qualities of God, his eternal Eternality, the fact that God is eternal, that He is all-powerful, and that He is holy, divine. All of those things, everyone knows without the Bible. We need the Bible and, the, and the, of course, the, the testimony of the Bible to know Jesus, to know about grace and Jesus and, and salvation. But any person uh, who, who is willing to, to be open in his mind and in his heart will know that God exists. And there are millions of, literally, of, of examples of this. But if a person is closed-hearted, let me put it this way, if his heart is closed to God, so will his mind be closed to God. And that's what Romans 1 continues on to say. It says in verse 21, because they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Paul's already told us that, that, that they suppress the truth in wickedness and unrighteousness. 
And because they do not want to retain God in their knowledge, then it says, and I love the Holman Christian Standard, there are several different translations of this, one word, but it says their thinking became futile. You can check and see what your Bible says in, in Romans 1, 8, uh, 121. Their thinking became futile. Their thinking became darkened. I like what the Holman uh, Christian version says. It says their thinking became nonsense. I think, honestly, and this is kind of the track that I've taken over the last few years in doing apologetics, that it, it's not that hard to show that atheism, disbelieving in God, leads to conclusions that are absurd. Uh, for example, if atheism and naturalism, nature is all there is, is true, you have no mind, you only have a brain. Now remember, they're building their case against God and against the Bible on reason and rational thinking. But if atheism and naturalism are true, they don't have a mind by which to think. Because a mind is not something physical, it's something metaphysical, it's something spiritual. Is something other than physical, immaterial. So if naturalism and atheism are true, everything they believe is the result of a blind, natural process, right? Everything. If nature's all you got, nature's all you can use for an explanation. There are no other explanations. Nature's all you have. So everything is a result of this blind process of evolution, and everything that we believe is a result of our genetic mutations. What connection then does that have to truth or reason or rationality? So in, in the very act of claiming that by reason and evidence we know that nature is all they, there is, they have explained away the process that they claim to have used to gotten to that conclusion. So it's ridiculous. And I think we can show that. Of course we need to do it in gentleness and respect. I'm preaching here in the church, so I might not use all those terms. Uh, but in gen gently to just ask questions to these unbelievers. And if we can show this to young people as they grow up, a lot of what I do today, I pastored 27 years. Part of the reason of me resigning the pastorate to start this ministry was I just saw what was happening. And apologetics played a role in my conversion, my coming to Jesus. I was a, uh, an atheist in uh, graduate school, getting a master's degree in philosophy at Vanderbilt University. And I hadn't done a lot of thinking about it. I think I was an atheist because I wanted to have my own way and didn't want God in the way, uh, which is the bottom line for every atheist, by the way. Um, but my reason for being an atheist was that there was way too much evil and suffering in the world for there to be a loving God. How can there be, how can you say that there's a God who loves us when there's so much evil and suffering in the world? That's the most, I didn't know it at the time, but that's the most popular reason that atheists give for their unbelief. Then as I started studying logic, which I claimed was, you know, King, I was where I would have claimed the age of reason and the enlightenment. I would have claimed myself of, as being a child of the enlightenment, which is what the new atheists claim. I started to realize, wait a minute, if there is no God, what does evil mean? Right? What do we mean when we say this is morally good and this is morally evil? Atheists spend a lot of time, most of them, the, the inconsistent ones, they spend a lot of time trying to show that you don't need God to be good. And I would agree to some aspect, you don't need God to do some good things. They don't get you credit in heaven, but uh, atheists do good things, good things that help are helpful to other people and may do them for the wrong reasons, but they can do good things. So you don't need God to be good so much as you need God for good to be meaningful, for there to be a good. So... Here's what, let me just I'll give you the quick moral argument, and this was what brought me to read the Bible. So if there's no God, 
How do we know what is good and what is evil? And I, I don't have time to expound the moral argument here. Um, we can do that at another time if you desire. If there's such a thing as evil, must there not also be such a thing as good? Okay, look, shake your head at me like you're here. Um, is that true? If evil exists, that's the way things ought not to be. You shouldn't be this way. This should not happen. A human being should not be trafficked. It's wrong. Do you agree with that? Okay, why is that wrong? Why is it not just survival of the fittest? If, if nature's all we have, isn't that the principle nature operates on? Survival of the fittest. It is. It's the only thing. Nature doesn't have a plan or a will. Nature doesn't know about us or care about us. So how can we say it ought not be this way? You did the wrong thing. You should not have stolen. You should not have harmed this person. It's, it's morally wrong. Why? Well, if evil is real, then good must be real. If good, the right thing, the way things ought to be is real, then you must have a moral law. You can't have good and evil without a moral law. And I believe at the heart of our universe, there is a moral law which is a reflection of the nature and love of God. So if you have evil, I, that was my excuse for not believing in God, but if you have evil, there must be good. If you have good, there must be a moral law. But if you have a moral law, there has to be a moral law giver. There has to be a reason, an intention, a purpose behind the whole show, as C.S. Lewis would say behind the universe. There's a reason that we're here. And I knew in my heart, even as an atheist, there, there must be some, is there any reason for me being here? Jean-Paul Sartre, the famous atheistic philosopher of uh, the hippie days, my hippie days, uh, said, here I sit struggling for my existence, trying to make sure I survive when there is absolutely no reason for my existence at all. And if God doesn't exist and we're just here as a product, accidental product of a blind process of nature, then there's no reason for us to be here. But we know, and that's exactly what the atheists demand of us. They demand that we reject all of our intuitive knowledge. We know that there's a reason for us to be here. We can't live as if God doesn't exist. Even an atheist can't do that. As soon as he proclaims himself to be a good person, he has, he has admitted in his heart of hearts and admitted publicly that there must be a God. So, for me, once I saw that, I thought, well, atheism, I don't know how that can be true. So I prayed a prayer six months before I became a believer, and I said, God, if you're there, if you're real, if you will show me in such a way that I know it's you, I will accept that. I'll accept the truth. I won't try to change it. Well, time went on. Does God hear the prayer of an atheist? He heard mine. And uh, I just had this, I thought, okay, I looked at some other religions. I went, I studied some Buddhism, some Hinduism, some things I liked in those, but there were some just so terrible logical inconsistencies there. So I thought, okay, I didn't want to read the Bible. I didn't want to read the New Testament because... I thought I was afraid that I would become a cultural Christian, a Christian just because that's what my culture advanced. But I did. I read the New Testament. By the time I got through the Gospels, I was so under conviction I could hardly walk. And I was wrestling with this, and I thought, here's a person, Jesus, who expounds the greatest philosophy of life that could ever be imagined and boils down all of the commandments into two that we should love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbor as ourself. And I knew I hadn't done either of those. And so at 3 o'clock in the morning on September the 5th, 1972, I got out of my bed in my little Nashville apartment there where I was going to school. I didn't know I was getting saved, Pastor Sam. I was. But I didn't know the terminology uh, I've been to church enough. And I said, my, my prayer of salvation, when I put my trust in Jesus, I said, Jesus, I believe you're who you say you are. 
And that's the time when I put my trust in Christ. Now, it took the Word of God to bring faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. But apologetics, just the reason of God, the, the rationality of God and the absurdity of atheism pushed me to reading the Bible. So that's what apologetics is about. So it's always been an influence in my life. So I want to go through some things here. Uh, so the, the problem with the age of reason is that it denies any other way of knowing things, our experience. So uh, it's, there's absurdity there. It sounds so good to say we're all reasonable people and that we should be reasonable people. Uh, Paul even prayed, uh, and I, every pastor will know what this means, Paul prayed, God deliver me from unreasonable men. Um, every church leader and business leader knows what that verse is about. So here's how the devil works. Once the, the philosophy of the Enlightenment, the age of reason, became ingrained in European culture, Western culture, quickly following on that, as that philosophy began to infiltrate the seminaries, in came the process of higher criticism, which is next in your blank here. To look at the Bible not as an authority over us, but to take authority over the Bible and to subject it to our own reason, which has now become nonsensical because it is not in submission to God. And so the first project of these newer, higher critics who said, you know, would have claimed to be theologians and Christians, the fir their first project is this, we know miracles are impossible. And so we need to take the Bible and pretty much take the miracles out of it. It's called demythologizing the Bible. That was the process of theologians and seminaries in the 19th century, still going on of course. They have to explain these things in another way, you know, just for an example, the, the crossing, the, the, the parting of the Red Sea and the Jews escaping from Egypt was not really the Red Sea because that would be impossible, that would be a miracle, but it's the, maybe it's the Reed Sea, which is about an ankle deep uh, expanse of water, not too far from the Red Sea. So they said, well, probably it wasn't the Red Sea, it was the Reed Sea. And so the Israelites just walked across. There's something silly in that too. If that's the case, then an even greater miracle took place because God drowned all of Pharaoh's army in ankle deep water. So the process of higher criticism then went on. Now, what was the church's answer to both of these great movements in history? How did the church respond to the Enlightenment? Not very well. Do you know who, uh, this is the quote up here, okay, this is a good place to start. We do have a PowerPoint. Uh, everybody know who William Wilberforce is? Okay, the great British leader who, who really spent his life, his first inclination was to go into the ministry. If you haven't seen the movie Amazing Grace, I highly recommend it. Um, in, a, in 1787, this great theologian and leader, said, if we neglect the training of Christian young people in the defense of Christianity, we should not be surprised when they abandon as adults the faith which they are unable to defend. Doesn't that make sense? And, I, and I'm teaching, one of the things I do now is I teach uh, part-time in a, uh, just a few classes in a Christian high school. I teach Bible for an 11th grade group, and I'm teaching them the scriptures, but along with that, I'm trying to prepare them. They're all going to hit the university in a couple of years, and when they get there, they're going to be bombarded, if they aren't already, and they are, by the media, by entertainment, by their peers. Um, I even have an, an atheist in my high school class in a Christian school, if you can imagine that. So, here's the warning. And his warning is given in the idea that that's what the church at that time was by and large doing, kind of retreating from the world. And they would say, well, you can't argue somebody into the kingdom. Sure you can, if the Holy Spirit's doing the arguing. Uh, you can make the case for Christianity. That's what, an, uh, you know, attorneys used to be called apologists because they were making the case. They were giving a reasonable defense or a reasonable answer for something. So then we finally come after, uh, and let's go to the next, uh, since we're using this, let's go to the next. Can you advance the slide? Do that. Make sure it all made through, okay. 
as this, as this types itself out here, I could have altered this. This is a quote by a great theologian given in 1913 in the, in the heat of the, the battle in seminaries about higher criticism. Believing Christians in response to that movement of higher criticism, instead of staying in, instead of engaging, pretty much what the Christians did was retreat. And they started their own colleges, their own seminaries, their own publishing houses, and conceded this battle of demythologizing the Bible to the world. Well, to me, they let, and basically sent their missionaries to third world countries like Africa and China, which is fine. Don't get me wrong. I'm for that. But God has given us, here's my point, God has given us the evidence. He's given us the reason uh, to prepare ourselves to be ready to give a reasonable answer for the hope that is in us. Here's what J, uh, theologian J. Gresham Mackin said, brilliant theologian. He said, false ideas, ideas are the greatest obstacle to the reception of the gospel. We may preach with all the fervor of a reformer, with little or no success, if we permit the whole collective thought of the nation to be controlled by ideas which by the resistless force of logic prevent Christianity from being regarded as anything more than a harmless delusion. Under such circumstances, what God desires us to do is to destroy the obstacle at its root. His warning pretty much went unheeded. Now that brings us to the next slide. So you can go one more and the next blank and this is pretty much where we'll stop. And I wish I could go on here but uh, I think it's better to emphasize this. His case, listen to me, what, what uh, uh, J. Gresham Mackin said is biblical. And I, this is the whole case right here. I want you to see this. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5 the weapons of our warfare are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, we have, we have divine power to demolish strongholds. Now let's stop there. Don't read any further. What does God mean when He says to us that we have divine power to demolish strongholds? What are strongholds? Well, we think of them in a practical sense as enemy territory. We think of them in a practical sense maybe as in a spiritual sense, as the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Satan can have strongholds in our lives. On an intellectual front, we think of strongholds as the reasoning of the age of enlightenment, as the reasoning behind higher criticism, as the reasoning behind Darwinian evolution, which put the capstone on, on destruction of faith. I mean, once you get, say, in the age of reason, uh, that uh, nature's all there is, but you really don't have an explanation for how we got here. Then you, most of the, of the philosophers in the Age of Enlightenment became deists. God may have exist, but He's not involved. He's abandoned us. Um, and then you have the second thing, the higher criticism. We certainly don't need the Bible. We cannot trust that. We can put the Bible under our scrutiny rather than being scrutinized by the Bible. Finally, the explanation... Well, the, we, God's not how we got here. Evolution, na nature's how we got here. Every explanation is now natural. Well, once you have a, a somewhat reasonable explanation for that, boom, the door is shut. And in the end of that century, the great German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche made the announcement, God is dead. But he also predicted as a result that the 20th century would be the most violent in history. And his prediction became a prophecy the 20th century had more violent deaths than the 19th centuries preceding it combined. More people and better technology to be sure, but less God than ever to be sure. So in our culture, and I understand that's what's happening here, Satan has great strongholds in the minds and in the hearts of a culture. What does God tell us to do? Look at this. It says to demolish the strongholds. God's given us power. What are these strongholds? Now here's the, my case. Here's my, my apology for apologetics. We demolish what? What's the next word? Arguments. arguments. Huh. 
We, we demolish arguments. We do. We do. I think, don't you think that would require some preparation? Some thinking, some reasoning on our own? Some sifting through the evidence on our own? We demolish arguments and every pretension. A pretension is a presupposition. It's a worldview. Think about this. It says we demolish every argument and every worldview. Pretension is what you believe when you start out. And Romans has already told us if you start without God, you're going to end up in nonsense. I think we can show that. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against, listen to this, the knowledge of God. Anything that prevents people. So I want to lead people to faith in Jesus Christ. And if they don't believe in God, then they're, they're, that is in the way. That's an obstacle. So I want to demolish that. In gentleness and respect, I want the Holy Spirit to demolish it in their heart. If disbelief in the Scriptures is the problem, I want to help them know that the Bible is very credible and very historically reliable. Whatever's in the way. And we take captive every thought to make, obedient, make it obedient to Christ. Um, and I'm going to just get, fill in the blanks for you here. Our time is gone. I'm sorry to keep you a little late. Uh, the first apologist was Jesus. And probably the next slide will be Acts 1-3, I hope. Is there an actual? Yeah. Yes, here it is. It's going to be typed out. I, did, I do this in a different way. But this is Acts 1-3. This is why I say Jesus was the first apologist. We think, I don't know why, Christians seem to have the idea that Christianity is just faith. It's just almost blind faith. Well, that's the accusation the atheists make against us. But Jesus showed Himself alive over a period of 40 days to His disciples by many infallible proofs. They weren't expecting a resurrection. They were defeated, shamed. Their Messiah, who was supposed to take over the Romans, had been killed by the Romans. They didn't know what to think. So after His resurrection, they experienced over a period of 40 days the risen Christ. They experienced it. They were eyewitnesses. And there's so many verses. As a matter of fact, I won't have time to give you this one, but write down in your notes, 2 Peter 1 16 through 20. That's why I think God used Peter to give us that command in 1 Peter 3.15. 2 Peter 1, 16 through 20, here's what Peter says. We did not devise cunning myths and fables, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. The whole case for Christianity, from Jesus to the apostles who were the next apologists, was an eyewitness testimony of experience as if they were on the witness stand in court telling what happened to them. In Acts 10.41, you can read the sermons of the apostles, and I've got that there. So, I'll finish with this. 2 Corinthians 4.4, which maybe, let's go through, let's hit that last slide, hit a couple slides there, see if you can find 2 Corinthians 4.4, and we'll finish there. The God of this world has blinded the minds. So here's what happens, and here's what I think where we need to change our procedures somewhat in the church. Meet the picture I gave you before that you saw was a young girl named Susan. I want you to imagine her. She loves school. She goes to school every day, and her teachers are smart, and she makes straight A's. Some of her teachers even wear lab coats and they present her with reason and facts and evidence and she knows that her teachers are smart. Then on Sunday, she loves to go to Sunday school. She's only eight years old and she's about to turn nine and so she goes to Sunday school and she loves that. She gets dressed up and she goes to Sunday school and her teachers tell her stories, Bible stories. And she knows that her teachers are nice, sweet, kind. But as she gets older into junior high school and high school, 
And more and more it becomes open in her class at school that the Bible can't really be literally true and uh, uh, nature is really what's happening and, and we can know things through science and she begins to see a division between the facts and the evidence and the reason of science and the stories and the faith of Sunday school. And sooner or later, and this is exactly what the new atheists are milking, she has to make a choice. Am I going to live by reason and evidence or by faith? And she sees it as an absolutely incompatible way to live. What I want to show is that it is reason, reasonable, and there is evidence to live by faith in the Son of God. That's apologetics. That's preparing ourselves to give a reasonable answer for the faith that is in us. And God has provided us with plenty of reason and plenty of evidence for anyone whose heart is open to receiving the truth. Let's pray. Father, thank You for this time. I pray it hasn't been too long. And I just pray that uh, just the inspiration of doing this work, of making this preparation and the opportunities that come with that. Lord, I thank You for the influence of this in my life, the confirming my faith through reason and evidence. And I pray, Lord, that You would help this time to have been profitable, the seminar yesterday to be profitable, and the service uh, in a little while to be profitable as well. Um, I pray Your blessings on this pastor and upon this church. Lord, what a sweet, wonderful spirit. Uh, I pray that You would enlarge their coasts and protect them, deliver them from evil, and continue and bless, Lord, by Your grace, by Your power, their love for one another that may be seen in the community, that the community may know that the Father has sent the Son. In Jesus' name, Amen.